topic was such a huge topic, thrombotic microangiopathy. I've tried to concise it as much as possible, taking you through the following contents. Thrombotic microangiopathic syndromes and approach, atypical HOS with pre and post transplant workup and management. And in the end, MCQs and certain cases will come in between uh, for the PGs as well. So to start off, of, uh, thrombotic microangiopathy describes a pathological lesion of arterioles and capillaries that produces microscopic thrombosis. It's basically an umbrella term for a wide range of illness and with distinct pathophysiologies. Overall, thrombotic microangiopathy can be divided into primary as well as secondary causes. Primary being thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, shigatoxin E. coli HUS, metabolic HUS syndromes, diacyl glycyl kinase E. HUS, and atypical HUS, which can also further be divided into primary and secondary. And the secondary causes of TMA, hypertensive emergencies, pregnancy, post kidney transplant, infections, drugs, cancer treatment, autoimmunity, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, and miscellaneous causes. Basically, a good healthy capillary has endothelial cells lined up side to side with a good lamellar flow, including plasma, platelets, and RBCs. Whenever there is a damage to the endothelial cells, the platelets get activated, activated and they form a plug, which causes a microthrombotic episode there, which through which when the blood passes, the RBCs get connected, which is they get dysmorphic. So this is a vessel blocked by platelets and damaged RBCs, and the flow is affected. So looking at each one of the thrombotic microangiopathies, we start with hereditary TTP. So basically, it's a biallelic mutation in the ADAMS13 gene. More than 150 mutations have been identified which causes a severe ADAMS13 deficiency, which is important to cleave the ultra-large VVF one Willebrand factor multipers, because of which non-cleavage, along with certain conditions that trigger the acute episodes like pregnancy, infection, inflammation, they are joined together to activate the platelet and form the microvascular thrombosis. In these cases, basically, unlike ITP, they can be treated by repleting the ADAMS13, which probably is by adding a plasma infusion, which has a half-life of three to eight days. Plasma infusion is the current standard of care with treating acute episodes and prophylaxis in those where there are recurrent symptoms. And in patients where there are severe neurological symptoms or in pregnancy where they can use plasma exchange as well. And there is an availability of recombinant ADAMS13, which is currently undergoing phase three trial, which will be available soon. Looking at the second part of it, immune-mediated TTP, where there are autoantibodies which either neutralize or increase the clearance of ADAMS13. IgG antibodies are more common, secondly being IgG and IgGM, which cause severe ADAMS13 deficiency, leading to ultra-large von Willebrand factor multipers which bind to platelets, and the same thing continues to form platelet activation and aggregation, with forming a platelet-rich thrombi, which obstructs the blood vessels, causing red blood cell fragmentation and micro angiopathic hemolytic anemia, leading to organ ischemia. Here, in this case, the advancements of treatments by replacing the ADAMS13, which can be done by both plasma exchange and giving plasma transfusions, you can use corticosteroid, which will suppress the antibody formation. In some cases, we require rituximab for B-cell lymphocyte inhibition and capilacizumab, which helps in, in inhibiting the VF interaction with the platelet G2B protein. The next in the syndrome is the Shiga toxin. E. coli associated hemolytic hemorrhagic syndrome, where this produces a Shiga toxin 2, which causes increased complement activation and MAC formation, increased production of pro inflammatory cytokines, which forms platelet leukocyte aggregation and activation of monocytes and neutrophils, releasing factors, which act on the injured endothelial, causing activation of pro coagulant endothelium with impaired VVF cleavage and ADAM13 increased platelet addition, activation, and aggregation, forming finally the microvascular thrombosis. 
no specific uh, supportive treatment is enough in most of the cases. Certain cases where complement activation is expected, in those cases, we can consider eclosimab. And even in patients where there are severe neurological and end organ damage, plasma exchange is used. Next type of TMA is your drug induced TMA. It's a very important type of TMA syndrome where there are both immune and non immune mechanisms. Drugs like calcineurin inhibitors, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, serolimus, interferon alpha beta, mitomycin, VGF inhibitors, which is now commonly used in CA treatment, proteasome inhibitors like bortezomib, carfilmozomib, and ponatinib. And others like emicizumab, valproic acid, and MDMA drugs, which are in use, and IVIG, these cause non immune direct injury, leading to endothelial dysfunction, increased platelet aggregation, excess activation of complements, and clotting factors. In most of these cases, just discontinuing the drug helps us in getting reversal. Supportive care is quite good enough. Patients where complement blockade may be beneficial, such as in severe cases. And in certain cases, even future rechallenge with dose reduction can be considered beneficial to outweigh the risk. Same way, this is another drug induced thrombotic microangiopathy mechanism is immune based. We di distinguish drug induced TMA from drug induced ITTP based on the normal ADAM 13's level and as well as. Antibodies are usually dependent on the presence of the drug or its metabolites. So here the drugs are mainly quinine, trimethoprine, sulfamethoxazole, fluoroquinolones, metronidazole, which are we commonly use these drugs, famicyclovir, and immunosuppressants like neuromonab which is not in use, adalimumab, and cancer treatment, which is commonly used, gemcitabine and oxyblatin. Here also the main thing to do is the present discontinue the drug and permanently avoid this drug in future compared to the other where it was a non-immune mechanism. Supportive care and plasma is initiated if TTP is suspected or confirmed with the ADAMS 13 level less than 13, 10%. Coming to the next set of uh, TMA is mainly an hematopoietic cell transplant associated TMA. Mostly it's consisting on three phases like first age, second and third age. Reconditioning phase is basically because of prolonged immobilization, infections, and other catheter-related infections, genetic predisposition, which causes preconditioning of the endothelium to form pro-coagulant endothelium. Second, it is because of direct toxicity of the drug, high-dose drugs, and total body radiation, which finally, when in the presence of calcineurin inhibitors, mTOR infections in the third fit, causes activation of the classical as well as the alternate complicant cascades, leading to activation of lymphocytes and antigen-presenting cells, causing endothelial injury and ending up with microvascular thrombosis. Mostly in this case, we give supportive measures like blood pressure control, support renal functions, blood transfusions, support erythropoiesis, and identify and treat the potential triggers like infections, graft versus Woods disease, or discontinue the drugs causing the same, or consider plasma exchange or rituximab in patients where there's autoantibody present. Complicant blockade is uh, if there is proteinuria and elevated complement MAC levels is strongly considered. Eclusimab may be beneficial in high-risk TMA on, of a, this transplant associated and is being investigated among other complement inhibitors. The next uh, TMA is your metabolic TMA, where this is mainly because of the disorders of vitamin B12 metabolism, methyl malonic acid, hemohomocysteine C gene defect is present in these cases because of which we have high homocysteine levels and low methionine levels in the blood, and urine shows high methyl melanic acid urea. Treatment is by giving high-dose vitamin B12 and folic acid, and there is complete reversal of the same. Coagulation-mediated TMA, basically the factors like thrombomodulin, plasminogen, diacyl resol kinase epsilon gene defects are positive agents of coagulation-mediated TMA. They basically regulate the complement and the coagulation cascades, and this represent mainly the familial TMS. Next, it was if the COVID-19 infection, which we recently had as a presentation of TMA, was still in debate whether it is a part of TMA or it's just a manifestation. Looks like more of a manifestation because most of these patients had hypopercable state secondary to the disease, and they had large vessel thrombus in the autopsies rather than small vessel. 
not associated with any microangiopathic hemolytic anemia or thrombocytopenia. And if at all there were thrombocytopenia, it was seen maybe due to the features of DIC in those patients. Adam TS13 activity was not affected severely. And most of the microvascular thrombosis present was probably secondary to the complement mediated activity. With these uh, differentials of the thrombotic microangiopathy, we come to certain investigations to identify the same. In patients with TTP, which have got congenital TTP, you can see for mutations in Adam's T13 gene. And for acquired, you can see for the activity of Adam's T13, percentage of which less than 10% signifies the importance of the same. In infection, Shiga toxin associated E. coli, we do PCR for Shiga toxin or stool culture for the same. In atypical HUS, we go for gene mutations in complement regulatory proteins, where we try to manifest the presence of complement factor H, I, M, C, P, that is membrane cofactor protein, C3 factor, complement factor B, thrombomodulin, and other autoantibodies to complement factor H. These le levels are done by stud genetic studies. For the secondary causes, patients having malignant hypertension, to be a BP more than 200 by 100 millimeters of mercury. Just blood pressure monitoring and renal function monitoring is required. Investigations as prior done for pulling out other causes of micro thrombotic microangiopathy associated with hypertension. Control of blood pressure usually helps in reversal of this. Pregnancy associated TTP, like patients presenting in preeclampsia, eclampsia, and HELP syndromes. They possibly have an elevated liver enzymes most of the time, and they are mainly presenting in the third trimester or postpartum. Usually, delivering the child helps in clearing off most of the complications and not be required to give plasma exchange. Drugs and toxins, as we discussed before, discontinuation of the drug is the best in patients where there is non-immune mechanism, like in patients like using tactolimus drugs, where we can consider a re start of the drug later on to see whether we can continue those drugs in those patients. But immune-mediated drug injury should not be continued. Infections, consider the why cultures which have current infections detected can be cured. Cancer treatment, both drugs and the cancers like of the breast, lung, predisposed to HUS. Autoimmune diseases like systemic lupus erythematis and Rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune SLE with APLA syndromes are known combinations. Autoimmune markers will identify the same, and treating the systemic lupus erythematis will help in resolving the condition. And in transplant, both solid organ and bone marrow, we have to consider other causes like GVST, graft rejection, along with these tests to find out the presence of PM. This is a picture showing the dysmorphic RBCs, which we also known as cystocytes. In the lab findings, we usually, for microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, we, we have high lactate dehydrogenase level, indirect bilirubin is high, negative Holmes test, decreased haptoglobulin, increased reticulocyte count, a non-immune thrombocytopenia. And in patients who present without MAHA or thrombocytopenia, usually we call them as focal TMA, which is detected by histology. When you look at the renal biopsy specimens of these patients, here one we can see where you have a congested glomerulus with capillaries, which is also known as a paralyzed glomerulus, and a segmented fibrinoid necrosis. This you see arrow points out. In this, it's shown an interlobular artery with edematous intima, mucoid intimal thickening, and significant luminal narrowing. And this is a bloodless glomerulus with thickened capillary walls as time passes with expanded mesangium, which is very important, causing closure of the capillary lumina. And here we can see a hilar arteriole with some fragmented RBCs within and luminal thrombosis. In IF, basically, you find immunoglobulins and C3 level antibodies, but in electron microscopy, we can see fibrinoid tactoids in the subendothelial area in thrombotic microangiopathy, as well as if you look into the increased lucency in the lamina interna rara with glomerular basement poric vision is common in HUS. So with all this background of inter types of TMA, the lab investigations, how we approach TMA. 
whenever with history and suspected TMA, first we have to confirm the presence of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia. Once you confirm that, you have to find out whether there is any underlying condition. If there is underlying condition, yes, for example, you have to look for DIC, infection, malignancy, any preeclampsia help syndrome in pregnant ladies, severe hypertension, systemic rheumatoid disease, hematopoietic cell transplant or solid organ transplant, we can look into the other causes first. If no secondary causes are present, then we determine by age, whether the patient is an infant or a child or an adult. Patient with infant or child with bloody diarrhea present, consider shiga toxin HUS. Patients with bloody diarrhea with absent, we can look into complemented mediated TMA, metabolism mediated TMA. On, in the adult part, we look into whether the, uh, how bad is the kidney injury. If the patient has no or minimal kidney injury, more of neurological with microangiopathy, hemolytic, and thrombocytopenia, we are looking at DTP. When you look at the kidney injuries present, then you look into acute and chronic things. If it's a chronic thing, you're mostly looking at drug induced TMA. We're looking at an acute kidney injury. Again, the common causes are drug induced, shiga toxin XUS, complement mediated, metabolism mediated, coagulation mediated. Very less likely to be DTP. And whenever the secondary causes are looked into, we can focus on those underlying conditions and try to treat the cause. With this, probably we'll be able to add easily identify the different types of TMA and the required treatments. Treatment options with each uh, of the syndromes were said before, but just to summarize, we had plasma exchange, plasma pheresis with uh, plasma transfusion, treatment underlying the cause as in secondary TMA, withdraw the drug and drug induced TMA, deliver the child in pregnancy induced uh, TMA with plasma transfusion and C5 inhibitor eclusimab as a savior for complement mediated TM. We look uh, go a little bit more specific towards the approach of a patient with atypical HUS, how pre and post transplant workup. As we are aware that in atypical HUS, we're looking at the complement system, the alternate pathway is affected. In complement system, we have got the classical pathway, the lectin pathway, and the alternate pathway. Classical pathway is triggered by the antigen antibody complexes. Lectin pathway is triggered when the lectin binds to the mannose on the pathogens and the pathogen and injured tissue directly alternate pathways activated by which C3 converters convert C3 into C3A with C3B opsonization, C5 is converted to C5A by C5 converters and the membrane active complex is formed by the combination of C5B to C5, 6, 7, 8 and 9. And this membrane attack complex exhibits cell lysis and activation of the inflammatory markers. So this is how the alternate pathway is activated. When you look at the gene defects with atypical HUS, uh, we have complement factor H, which frequency in HUS is up to 20 to 30%, which is the highest. And the risk of death of ESRD at first episode or within one year is up to 50 to 70%. So they are at high risk patients. We have risk of relapse of the disease is also 50%. And risk of recurrence after transplant is up to 75 to 90 percent. And plasma therapy is indicated in these cases. Same way, if you look at complement factor I, it's approximately 50 percent of episodes of deaths in the one year, relapses up to 45 to 80 percent post transplant. The least among the all is the membrane cofactor protein, where it's about zero to six percent, and the recurrence is also less than 20 percent. But there can be possible relapses of diseases commonly during the course of the patient's life. C3 factor deficiency, almost 40 to 70 percent recurrence. Complement factor B, almost 100 percent recurrence in the graft. And same way, anti factor, complement factor antibody present. And depending on the title of the antibody, the symptoms will be presented and recurrence is affected. Extra renal manifestations in atypical HUS patient can present with irritability, CNS symptoms of drowsiness, convulsion, hemipheresis, cardiovascular symptoms of MI, myocarditis, peripheral vascular disease of gangrenous lesions in the fingers and toes, can present with pulmonary hemorrhage, can present with abdominal pain, pancreatitis, intestinal bleeding, and rhabdomyolysis. 
investigation remains the same of all the factors, which will be explained further. We always uh, support, start with supportive treatment, definitely go for plasma paralysis, renal transplant, and complement inhibitors. Eclosimab is used in the treatment of the same. Eclosimab five year data proved that it is quite safe and no new safety concerns were identified for adult and pediatric populations with atypical HOS ever treated with eclosimab in the real world setting. So, there were patients with got some meningococcal infections, some sepsis, and death during the course of the study. So what is the need for pre-transplant workup in these patients? So we know that atypical HOS is because of overactivation of the alternate pathway. We are aware of the fact that there are a lot of genetic variants of the complement proteins, which we are not sure, when mostly it is identified in up to 60 to 70% of these patients. The recurrence of the kidney transplant is very, very high. So we have to depend on the underlying complement abnormality and find out what is the factor deficient. Long-term kidney transplant was initially in quantum decade, but now with the advancement of understanding of the pathogenesis and the anti-complement drug exclusive available, it's been easier to go ahead with transplant in these cases. So that is why we are looking into the workup. For pre-transplant uh, evaluation, we must have serum C3, C4, CH50, and Adams T13 level. C4 level high in factor H and auto antibody variant also, so as to be ruled out. Normal C3 levels do not exclude the mutations in complement regulatory proteins, which will be explaining in the next slide. Serum factor level of H, anti-factor H autoantibody levels has to be checked along with the same. MCP expression and leukocytes are identified by flow cytometry, which detects up to 75% of the cases. And genetic testings for all the above factors has to be sent, including diastyl, gristyl, kinase, and thrombomodulator. With uh, these uh, tests, we'll be able to identify the patients at low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. In between, during this studies concerning the transplant recurrence, they found a variance of uncertain clinical significance. So up to 50% of the variants have known clinical significance, but nowadays they are able to make a recombinant protein, which will assess the regulatory function and perform structural modeling of these proteins to find out who is benign and who is pathogenic. That is how it is reported. And the importance of these uh, proteins or these variants is that if they report it as pathogenic, then in the uh, treatment, uh, prophylactic eclizumab should be given prior to transplant, expecting that these patients will have problems post-transplant. Genetic uh, testing can be done in the Department of Microbiology, KM Hospital Pune, where they do the Adams T13 activity and anti-factorous antibody. Each test costs around 3,000 rupees. 3 ml of separated serum in a plain vacuum tube for anti-H antibody and 3 ml separated whole blood for Adams T13 is used. They are packed in dry ice. Results in 24 hours for factor H antibody. And Adams 13, it depends on the batch samples when it reaches up to 20. Also, there is lab in many labs have been set up in many cities, but Datomics lab have been spun in Bangalore. Medicine McLab is also present, where they request genetic testing for renal disorders with about rupees 22,000 to range to rupees 40,000. But here, the week uh, recovered turnaround time for these reports is about four to five weeks, and we require about five ml of blood in EDTA for transportation in cold ice. So, what about the selection of the donor for these patients? So, in live related donor, so, living related donor kidney transplant is relatively contraindicated for patients with AHOS. This is primarily for donor safety because donor effect on may trigger TMA in the genetically susceptible donor. And some patients may have more than one mutation. So, again, that will be a problem post transplant. One third of the patients with AHOS, genetic testing does not reveal a variant or in the complement gene. So, we may miss it and post transplant, the patient can have a problem. So usually living donor transplants could be considered with caution on a case-by-case -case basis. We may consider live-related uh, donor transplant in patients who carry a known pathogenic mutation in a complement protein, which is determined to cause the disease in the patient and donor, which can be negative for that mutation. So basically what we are trying to highlight over here is that we have to get the different types of mutations with the variants at the least possible variant can be selected for donation. The recipient and the potential living donor should participate in decision-making after they understand the risks and benefit of this option. Many times the patient 
comes up with a familial donor and they are very insistent of going ahead with transplant. We had a similar problem in the past, but we had to have a separate consent for this. Explaining that possibly the same disease can recur in the post-transplant phase. Leaving unrelated donors can be considered for kidney transplant if genetic testing is negative in there. Disease donor transplant is a viable option for these patients. Now we go to the perioperative management in these patients. So risk assessment will be based on the what factors are present and whether the patient has any history in the past. So low risk are patients who have got isolated MCP mutations or persistent negative anti-complement factor H negative. So in these patients, generally in the outside world, they do not give prophylaxis with eclusinab. Patient with high and moderate risk where the factor is complement factor H, C3, complement factor B, they definitely give prophylactic eclusinab. And those patients who have non-pathogenic component of these or an isolated complement factor are eclusimab later also. So pre-transplant may not consider. Transplant protocol with eclusimab prophylaxis will consider first. So they, whenever they are able to give eclusimab, they go with basiliximab induction. Triple immunosuppression, they can take tractolimus, MMF, red. Only difference is in a susceptible host, they go for a level of tractolimus to be maintained around 4 to 5. The low dose tractolimus is preferred to keep it rough around 5 to 7. Injection methylprednisolone 500 milligrams is given pre-transplant and eclusimab 900 milligrams is given pre-transplant one day prior, that is 24 hours prior. Eclusimab is available as a 300 milligram dose. So three such vials have to be used pre-transplant. Recommendations for plasma, their plasma exchange with FFP is done within four to six hours before transfer, craft pre-perfusion. And during surgery, you just uh, transfuse plasma at 10 to 20 ml per kg. And after surgery, some people do up to five times a week for two weeks or daily for five days initial plasma exchange with fresh frozen plasma. Eclusimab dosing in living unrelated donors, 24 hours before is the first dose, as we mentioned. And on the post-transplant is weekly, up to the first four weeks it is given at 900 milligrams. And thereafter, week five, 1200 milligrams. And that is repeated every two weeks thereafter. In patients who are receiving a diseased donor kidney, we administer eclosimab similarly, 900 before, or mean not before, I mean at the time of transplantation. And the post-transplant eclosimab dose is based on the above regimen. The side effects seen in eclosimab is hypertension, headache, upper respiratory infections, UTI, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and leukopenia, which can be tackled simultaneously. There are many reports of eclosimab being used as prophylactically in transplant and all have been successful to tell us the outcome. One of the very interesting studies is this, where they had three groups. First group, the diagnosis was made prior to transplant. Eclosimab was given before transplant. Almost 88 patients were there. And the group 2A, where the diagnosis was prior to transplant, but eclosimab was given after transplant. And group 2B, where diagnosis was after transplant and even eclosimab was given after transplant. And what happened to the end result? The post-transplant median six-month GFR in group 1 was around 60.6, where they diagnosed before and even given eclosimab before. Whereas in group B, it was only 31.5, where they diagnosed the mutation, but they gave the eclosimab later. And in the group 2B, both was afterwards where the GFR fell like 9.6 or the graph function was lost. So delays the diagnosis of an atypical HUS and a delayed treatment with eclosimab post-transplant leads to inferior outcomes. The same was studied with uh, another uh, study where they support the use of eclosimab prophylaxis who have a medical history and complement in, uh, investigations which predict a high or moderate risk of post-transplant recurrence. If you just see this graph, the first one with high risk, the triangle one are the one which with eclusimab, they had a better post-transplant period with uh, recurrence-free inter-survival with high percentage. But without eclusimab, the percentage fell drastically. So they included that eclusimab is good as a prophylaxis. Any cocal vaccine should go along with it prior to the transplant for avoiding life-threatening visceral meningitis. A booster dose is given every five years till you are continuing with eclosimab. Now we go for something in our setup where we have a transplant protocol without eclosimab in such low risk cases, whether we can consider them for transplant. 
So ATG is preferred over bisiliximab induction in such cases. Triple uh, immunosuppression is maintained same, but here we try to keep a low dose trichromus, preferred to around the range of five to seven in the beginning itself. Injectable methylprednisolone is given pre-transplant and eclusimab only if there is recurrence. Five sessions of plasma paresis pre-transplant and two sessions of plasma paresis post-transplant and then post-transplant surveillance to see whether these patients are having any need of further plasma paresis. So this was a case series from Netherlands where they used 17 patients of atypical HUS with 16 carrying genetic variants of very severe types like complement factor H, I, C3, C5. Five out of 17 patients had previous graft loss due to recurrent DHS. Still, they went with an induction of basiliximab. No eclusimab was used in this study. They went with a low-dose stack, MMF rate, strict monitoring of blood pressure. So what they did was they trained the patients for hypertension, hematuria, proteinuria, and deranged renal functions at home. And they were doing constant follow-up for 25 months. And they maintained the average creatine of 1.2 even after this. One graph was lost due to recurrence, which could not be salvaged with. In patients who have got anti-factor H sort of antibody, plasma exchange and rituximab should be given pre-transplant and eclusimab post-transplant with maintenance immunosuppression. If the titer is more than 1000, there's very high chances that there will be recurrence in the graph. Combined kidney liver transplant is best in terms of we can replenish the factor H, I, C3, C, which are synthesized in the liver. Sometimes there is an uncontrolled complement activation due to surgical stress leading to coagulative hepatic necrosis and leading to liver failure. And there is a significant potential morbidity and mortality because of combined organ transplant. When you look at monitoring, which is the most important part of such transplant, CBC, complete blood count, renal panel, urine analysis, LDH and haptoglobin has to be seen weekly for the first week, daily for the worst week, weekly up to six months, and then bi-weekly for up to one year and every month after 12 months. So this thing is very, very important. Very first year should be obtained in addition if there is any concern for recurrence. Recurrence uh, patients with recurrent DHS usually present within first year or often within days to weeks. And what are the triggers? First trigger is at the table bench preparation itself. That is when they manipulate the artery and this. You have to be very careful in such patients. So ischemia reperfusion injury, immunosuppressive drugs like CNI mTOR, Antibody mediated rejection can present infections like cytomegalovirus, BK virus, upper respiratory or gastroenteritis can be a trigger. So, all this is very common for recurrence in these patients. Risk of recurrence is most highest in most of them, but except for patients with MCP. And the recurrence is low in MCP because the allograft expresses normal membrane bound MCP. So, that is why the recurrence is less. And patients at moderate risk of recurrence are those where you've got the variant category. So when you do the genetic study, we must look into the variant category as well. Treatment of recurrence is same. You continue eclusima weekly for four weeks and at 1200 milligrams at week five and thereafter every two weeks and plasma pheresis in the initial phase. Few reports are replacing tacrolimus with belatocept at particular few centers. In high risk cases, we have to give this eclusima thereafter for lifelong. But in low risk cases, after 24 months, you can reassess and consider stopping eclusimab. Uh, I would like to mention here that one 300, uh, one dose of 900 milligrams will cost around 5 lakhs of Indian rupees at this point of time. When we talk about de novo HUS, uh, after a kidney transplant, around 1 to 5% cases are reported. In one series, complement variants were identified in 29% patients. So basically, patient carrying a low risk of AHUS, risk multiplies after transplant due to multiple factors like reperfusion injury and ABPM. So basically there has to be some underlying deficiency. I'd like to add in an interesting case of DeNova post-HUS transplant. As a 21-year-old female who underwent a successful disease donor live transplant. Five years later, she had postpartum, she had an atypical HUS. Genetic screening did not reveal any complement variants in her. But screening of the DNA available from the donor showed a nonsense complement factor H mutations which led to the factor H deficiency. So, a typical HUS was facilitated in this lady by an acquired rare genetic variant in the presence of the trigger, which was pregnancy in her. So, that is also acquired, it can be possible in a post transplant de novo case. There's a novel agent which is coming up other than eclosima by the name Ravuluzumab. 
which is a long acting c5 inhibitor so probably will help us with the doses to be reduced to up to sustain up to 8 weeks of dosing interval so that is what we are looking at in the future this is an mcq question for the pgs explaining the possibility of recurrence of ahs in graft which one has the least chance of recurrence of the primary disease so whether it is factor h mutation factor b mutation i or isolated mcp and we saw in our uh, previous presentation that isolated mcp has the least chance of recurrence thank you